Hello, hello there. Uh, people still gathering. So today, um, let me introduce myself. I am Sergey Zolotov from Ukraine. Uh, we are working in product team, uh, and we've been using uh, Kotlin in production on our backends more than two years now. And we are adopting coroutines. So uh, coroutines were in the spotlight for the last year. There are a lot of blog posts, uh, discussions, and it was uh, the most weighted feature. Uh, so they were released a um, couple, uh, couple weeks ago uh, on site with uh, Kotlin. And we already got some experience of running it in production. Uh, so today, I'm going to share you this experience, uh, how we ended up like this, uh, why we actually use coroutines. I'll show you a live coding demo of real usages. And uh, after we'll talk about some problems of non-blocking code, about multi-threading. And in final, I'll show you uh, what we got and how actually coroutines and non-blocking services helped us uh, to reduce uh, costs of running uh, services in production. So um, the first problem that we wanted to solve is uh, asynchronous handling. We had just regular Spring Boot application uh, running on servlets, and for incoming requests, we need to do uh, another request to downstream services, combine those results, uh, do another request, uh, combine results again, and so on. And after this, we can return the response to our user. So just regular service, uh, as you all have. But uh, some services uh, need to do more than 100 requests only for one user. And this is why we uh, wanted to optimize this, and we choose non-blocking uh, HTTP client. Um, and more of this, uh, response time is uh, crucial for us. So uh, we want to do this concurrently. And now we have to uh, deal with asynchronous code. So how can we uh, deal with asynchronous code? The easiest way to do this is to use callbacks. Uh, but if you don't want to end up in hell of support this code, uh, you should not use, <laughs> use this way. And uh, we used promises in Java, it's uh, completable futures. It was OK, but when our code base started to grow, um, it was harder to support, and in the end, it almost impossible. So we continued to looking for another ways. And here uh, we tried Project Reactor because uh, Spring uh, has integration with it. Um, it was great, I must admit, but we don't have any stream of events. And using Project Reactor, uh, it comes with another paradigm. So. Uh, it will be overkill for our project only for uh, handling a, a synchronous code. So we, we started to look uh, further. And here come coroutines. They are part of a uh, feature of uh, Kotlin language, so you don't need to pull uh, a huge library like uh, Reactor. So uh, who of you know or hear about coroutines before have you visited a previous talk. So uh, because uh, I, I'm not going to reintroduce it, them again, so let's jump to live coding demo. I'll show you some examples. So what we want is to use kind of uh, a synchronous API uh, that returns us a synchronous result with completable future. So we want to find user by name, uh, get his repositories, uh, get his followers, and write it to cache. So we will get, in the result, this profile. Uh, you probably know completable future. And if you want to do this with completable future, it will be like this. So here we load our user. We want repositories, followers, combine it to a result, 
and after all, we save it to cache. So it looks terrible for me, <laughs> and it's not error prone. So what we want to do is to improve this code. So we will use coroutines. Uh, I'll just copy paste this code. So we will after compare it. So uh, at first, to use coroutines inside this method, we need to uh, add suspended modifier. So now we suspend our fun. And here is uh, idea complaining that we are calling a suspended function from not suspended function. So we need to mark uh, our main function as suspended as well. Uh, this is a feature from Kotlin 1.3. Uh, and if you don't do like this, you can just run blocking code and put it in there. But we will use more beautiful syntax. So let, let's start from user. We, we, we want to load user. So I'll just create a new variable user. And now it returns completable future. This is not what we want to do. Uh, we want to use it as coroutines. So we add uh, a wait method that will suspend at this point and unwrap this future to user. So if we use this, now it comes with user, just user, plain user. And we have marked this uh, at this point is suspension call. So we go on. We do the same for followers. So wait for them and repositories. Well, now we have uh, user our followers repositories, and we can combine it to profile. So we got profile here, and we save it to cache. And in the result, we will return our profile. Now it's complaining that we are returning a plain profile, so we don't need here completable future, so it's just profile. Now we don't need this code anymore. Nor that. So uh, we just rewrite, rewrote our code with coroutines, uh, but I still don't like it. We can improve it more because we have a lot of await calls. So what we do, we will introduce uh, a new API that uh, has suspended functions in it. So we will just refactor this code and create new methods. This method will return just, just user. Same goes for followers. Repositories. And for cache. So now it's better. We have just simple function calls. Uh, it could be service calls, but I use top level functions. And we don't have any await calls. We don't need uh, in this file these calls anymore, so I will move them to another file in this package. So we got more, more, more space. So. Um, we just uh, improved our code, uh, replacing asynchronous code with uh, sequential code. This that's code that we used to uh, work every day. Uh, it's like blocking code, and now we want to improve our code um, for performance. So we will introduce some concurrency in our code. It's easy to do with coroutines. 
because now all of this is uh, just one single coroutine that's running. But if you want to do uh, concurrency, so uh, what is actually concurrency? Uh, it means that uh, we should load uh, in concurrent way uh, the things that are not depending on each other. So in our case, followers and repositories uh, do not depend on each other. They only need a user. So in our case, we'll create a coroutine with coroutine builder, so we use a sync. And now we return again deferred object, but it's coroutine deferred object. And here is uh, our idea complaining that uh, we got uh, not just list, so we want to unwrap this code and get list again. But what it gives us that in this point, uh, our code will not be uh, waiting. So it will just go on here and we will launch another coroutine and wait for results here. So we just improved it and to if you want to improve something in performance, we probably want to measure it. So we need to measure this time. And print total time. So let's say Uh, calls to API takes for one second, so each call takes one second, and we have heavy operation, save to cache, it takes two seconds. And without coroutines, it takes five seconds to load the whole profile. Uh, but with coroutines, we run them concurrently, so we reduce this time and it runs only for four seconds. And in our case, we actually don't care about result of saving to cache because we may save it or not, we can recalculate it. So we'll launch a coroutine and we'll not wait for a result of it. So we'll use coroutine builder launch. And now we reduced to two seconds. And if we want to load multiple profiles like list of uh, profile of Rick, profile of Morty, and use our get profile. And if you run this, it will take four seconds. If you add someone more, it will take six seconds and so on. So we can run it same in concurrent mode. And this time it returns a list of different profiles. And we can use uh, a handy function or called uh, await all that will unwrap all of this to list of profiles. So we got now a list of profiles again, and if you run this, it will be loaded concurrently, and it takes only two seconds. So, do you see what's happening here, right? <laughs> it's good, because I'm hiding it by myself. Uh, now we use a uh, non nullable type for user, so it will definitely return it. But if it returns like uh, non nullable type, so now it's complaining that we may return user or not. So we want to handle this and to throw another error like we don't have that user. So now we have here a non nullable user, so we know for sure, and here we handle this case. Now let's revert re this.
So as you see, it's easy to introduce concurrency, and it's explicitly so. If you want to run something concurrent, uh, you see this in the code. But in the real applications, you may need uh, more complex cases like cancellations, uh, timeouts, deadlines, uh, limiting concurrency, retries. So let's work a little bit with um, cancellations. Um, we don't need here list of users. We need only one profile again. Break. So our function takes two seconds. But what if you don't want to wait more than one second? We can use uh, another function called with timeout or now, or just with timeout that will throw an exception. Uh, like timeout exception, but we don't need exception, we need only now. And we don't want to wait more than one second. So now it returns profile or now. And if you run this code, that takes two seconds. We can see that we got no profile, and this function took only one second. But if we wait before the exit of main function, like five seconds, we can see that user actually was loaded. And why that happened? Because uh, we already started some calls, like uh, in our case, we started uh, HTTP request to a service, and it could be just a uh, query to database. And in case of cancellation, coroutines does not interrupt uh, your runtime, so it will complete first, and only after this uh, it will cancel your uh, continuation. Because it's useful and you, you need to keep it in mind. So if you do some outgoing requests, you need to specify on your HTTP client the timeouts by yourself. And here, if we uh, load again multiple profiles, So we got our get profile, await, and we run this code. Guess what happens? We got cancellation, but uh, we started to load in users, repositories, so there was no real cancellation. Why that happened? Because when we canceled uh, our first coroutine. The other coroutines already started their work, so uh, they continue to load followers, repositories, and so on, so there is a leak, because we don't need those results anymore, so we just spent our resources. And it was default behavior uh, before uh, one month before release, and they introduced a structured concurrency that defines relations between coroutines. You can have uh, parent coroutine and children's um, because you need to run coroutine against um, some coroutine scope. And this scope could be a global scope, as we launched coroutines before, or it could be another coroutine, like uh, in our services, it's just request. So a structured concurrency, if you cancel a uh, parent coroutine, it will send the same signals to child coroutines, and it will get these cancellations too. So there will be no leak. Let's fix our code. In our case, this code, it's already coroutine scope, so we can 
replace this with this, and we don't need this because it's implicitly. And here, we can just remove global scope because this function uh, does not have any scope like here, so we need to define uh, this scope. That, that returns the final result here. I don't need to return. And now we have scope again, and we can replace this code just simple async. And if you run this, everything now fine. We just loaded users, and there was a cancellation. But we got, we just broke some optimizations that we did before. If we increase this timeout, so we all got results. And we run this. We can see the total time takes four seconds again. But it was two seconds. What's gone wrong? And we can see that for our safe cache, we launch coroutine in the same scope, but because of these relations, uh, parent coroutine uh, cannot do and return the result until all coroutines are completed. So uh, it waits for all children to complete, and after this, it will return the result. So we don't need to use uh, this scope here, so we'll return back a global scope. And if you launch it here, it will work again. Another case, uh, it's exceptions. What if we don't like Morty anymore and we throw an exception when Morty user was loaded? Here's exception, and now we want to catch this exception. And print something, what we got here. Now we, we can't use scope, so we'll just revert our global scope. And if we run this code, see what happens. We loaded users. We got an exception. Uh, our result here is a unit because it returns nothing. It takes one second again. And uh, for rig, we continue to load followers, repositories, and save in cache, uh, even that we don't need these results anymore because uh, this code got exception. Yes? Yeah, because uh, I launched some coroutines, and they, they can launch can be launched on another thread, so I don't want to exit from the main thread. That's why I got here delay. It doesn't matter. Don't pay attention for this. You, you, you can wait uh, until all your coroutines will end, but I, I took the easiest way. <laughs> You can join your coroutines to your main threads as you do with threads, like daemon threads. So let, let's get back to our exceptions. And what I want to say here, that we waste our time and we started to load it uh, rig followers and rig repositories, saving cache and so on, but we don't need these results. And Using structured concurrency, we can wrap all this call with some context, some scope, sorry.
and we launch here coroutine against this scope. And if we launch this code, we can see that after exception, everything is fine. What happens here? When in child coroutines uh, we got an exception, unhandled exception, it will go to parent coroutine. And before parent coroutine uh, exits, it will send cancellations to all his children. So the other coroutines will get these cancellations and we just canceled uh, rig requests as well. In the same scope. Uh, so I, I could show you a limited concurrency, but for this, uh, Roman Lazarov gave great talk, so you could watch it. And it's pretty <laughs> large discussion. So let's move on. Uh, we've done this fun part, and we'll go to the sad part. It's uh, multi-threading, because all that I showed you before, it could be run on a single thread, on a single core, even if you want to do something in concurrent way to avoid multiple requests. But in modern systems, we have multiple CPUs, so we want to use all of them. And here, coroutines come handy. But what's wrong with uh, traditional multi-threading? If you want to run something in parallel, we just create a new thread. And we can calculate something uh, factorial or big number, and it's perfectly fine. But when we create more threads, uh, here comes a price. At first, uh, creating a thread is expensive operation. Every thread takes one megabyte of memory. Uh, for switching active thread, OS needs to clear cache, uh, switch contexts, and so on. So. If it's um, expensive, why do we create threads? Uh, for example, if you want to uh, handle incoming requests, we create a thread. If you want to do outgoing requests to downstream service, we also create a thread. So in our applications, we have hundreds and thousands of threads, which actually do nothing. And if you create a lot of threads, your application probably just blow up with some out of memory exception. So you want to avoid this. And here come coroutines. Because they are like, yes? Uh, I will talk about this shortly, OK? And here come coroutines that are like lightweight threads. You can launch one million of coroutines and more, because every coroutine takes only dozens of bytes, not megabytes. And you must understand that coroutines does not replace or interchange your threads. More of that, they use thread pools uh, behind the scenes, but these pools are limited and bounded to your CPUs, so you don't need to do extra work to switch in these threads. And in the runtime, coroutines got a uh, dispatcher. This dispatcher takes coroutine from the event loop and put it to a free thread. And when coroutine needs to be suspended, like we do a call like find user by name, at this point, this coroutine does nothing. So it will be suspended and put back to the queue. And in this place, we will put another coroutine. This is how we can spin up millions of coroutines only with a single thread. So uh, you can just avoid to use a direct thread API by using coroutines. So if you need some CPU-intensive work and keep busy all of your uh, CPUs, you create coroutines. If you need concurrency, you create coroutines. If you need to handle incoming requests, you create coroutines again, because they are cheap. And now I, I hope you have better understanding of how coroutines work in runtime, because uh, here is our first major issue that we got uh, when we're trying to uh, migrate to non-blocking HTTP client. It's a thread local and MDC context. 
Very like hard on structured logging for those of you who don't know what is this. It's kind of a container where for incoming requests you put username, IP address, uh, some correlation ID, trace ID, and whatever. And after this, when you write to logs, this information will implicitly add it to your logs. And using Kibana or something like this UI, you can easily find all user requests uh, and what he done. And this great feature was completely broken. Um, let's see an example where we got thread local. We launched five coroutines. At the start of each coroutine, we put uh, identifier to thread local. We launch uh, inside another coroutine where we uh, print an actual ID and what we got in the thread local. And after the way, we print the same. If, and if you run this code, we can see kind of mess. Because inside uh, coroutines, we just lost our context. And after the way, something bad happened. If you run this with more verbose mode so we can see actual threads, we can uh, watch that second coroutine started on worker three. And inside, it started coroutine on worker eight. And after the way, it was resumed on another worker. So we cannot guarantee that coroutines after suspending stays on the same thread. And more of that, as I showed you before, for one thread can be scheduled uh, a lot of coroutines. And they will uh, share our thread local. And this is a race condition. So we want to avoid this. And it's easily fixed. If we convert thread local to coroutine context and run this code with this context, everything will be fine. So what we did to do this? Every coroutine has own context for continuation uh, metadata and for keeping data as container. And we used thread local and put this data to coroutine context. And before dispatcher schedules coroutine to a thread, it takes context and puts to real thread local. And after coroutine done its work, it uh, reverts all the thread local and prepares to another coroutine. So this is how it works. Same with MDC context, you just use a helpful function. But uh, this feature was introduced just two months ago. Before that, you had to do your own hooks to dispatchers and do black magic. There was a lot of bugs with that, so now it's finally solved. And the next problem, uh, it's not problem of coroutines, it's problem of GVM, and it's blocking code. Uh, people usually come to Slack channels and Telegram and ask this on a daily basis, so this kind of pain. Uh, let me show you why. If you return to our picture of coroutines and threads, and what happens if you block our running coroutine, so we run some blocking code inside, our underlying thread will be blocked. And because we have limited number of C, uh, threads, our CPU will be just idle and wasted. So, and if you don't have any fun at night, you could block all of your coroutines, all of your threads, and your service will just go down. We did this in production. It was not <clears throat> really good. So you must understand that coroutines will not make your blocking code as non-blocking in some kind of magical way because they do not own a runtime. They result in a compilation. So what kind of blocking code can make this destruction? It can be a regular GDBC driver or another blocking library like OKHTTP. Even if it has a synchronous API, it could be uh, blocking because it will create more threads, and this is what we want to avoid. It can be just a thread sleep. It will put thread in the sleep, and it will be blocked. 
Uh, same goes for synchronizations, but synchronization made for fast operations, so if it takes less than one millisecond, you shouldn't care about it. And it could be your legacy code that contains errors in a bow, so you need to keep in mind and in control what happened here. But Coroutine Library has an elegant answer for this. They introduced IO Dispatcher. If we have blocking code, uh, blocking call inside of our Coroutine, like we do some query to database that will block our Coroutine, we will wrap this code with this dispatcher, IO Dispatcher, and in this case, for this call, we've created another thread that can be blocked, and our limited numbers are safe now. You can say, why do we need to create more threads? We want to avoid them. But here's the good news that uh, default dispatcher and IO dispatcher, they use the same shared thread pool. So. Uh, if you have three threads in uh, your limited number of threads, your IO dispatcher will use those threads. But if all of them busy, they will create more threads in your thread pool, and it will grow and shrink if you don't need them. So it, it reuses threads. And more of that, you don't have any actual thread switch or jump to another call. So when you do this, it all stays on the same thread. This thread just marked that it belongs to IO dispatcher now and it can be blocked. And after this call, it reverts and goes back to default dispatcher. So you will stay on the same thread and you will not create more threads. This is good. And Actually, in real applications, uh, we don't have a lot of places where we use blocking code because we have plenty of libraries like Elasticsearch, MongoDB, and so on that provide non-blocking uh, APIs. And talking about libraries and your code, you want to integrate with them. Uh, I showed you before how to integrate with completable future. You just add a weight and it now behaves like coroutine. Same goes for Guava or reactive streams or implementations like RX or Project Reactor, for example. If you have Project Reactor in your uh, code that returns list of integers of wrapped with some kind of reactor type, you'd simply add um, extension method that We'll unwrap this type to coroutine, and you have, again, list of integers. So that's easy. We come all this way. We replaced uh, our HTTP calls with non-blocking libraries. We, we dealt with blocking code. We got our integrations. But one thing still left uh, working in a blocking way. It's our HTTP server. As I said before, we work on Spring. And we got servers. They work in blocking way. And at this point, we could stop because we already got some improvements, but we wanted to do this uh, non blocking service. We can use as an option uh, WebFlux, uh, which comes with Spring 5, but uh, in this case, you need to convert results from coroutines to reactor types. Or you can wait for official support in Spring that which come in next versions of 5.2, I guess. Uh, or you can just replace Spring with something else. So we are engineers. We decide carefully. So we just drop Spring framework and yes. Yeah, it still uses under the hood uh, additional threads. Uh, 
Yeah, but it probably will return you completable futures, so you need to, do, to deal with completable futures. Yeah. yeah, but I want to avoid this. So we, we replaced Spring Framework with KTOR with Netty. Why KTOR? Uh, because we actually didn't use a lot of, of Spring stuff. We don't use Spring Cloud because we got Kubernetes. And KTOR is simple. You need only one hour to read documentation, and you can go and write some real code. On the other hand, for Spring, you need to spend months to understand how it works. And it was uh, important in our team because we have multiple languages, and not of our members know Spring. So for them, it will be easier to uh, learn KTOR. Uh, KTOR are based on coroutines. And it developed by JetBrains and use it in JetBrains projects inside. And Coroutine team works with uh, KTOR team, so all the time you'll have all features of Coroutines at the time. And according to benchmarks, uh, it works two times faster than Node.js. It works 10 times faster than just servlets on Tomcat. And even for us, it was surprised that it works faster than any of GoLand framework, except faster HTTP. And you can check it by yourself. It's official benchmarks. It's tech empowered. So uh, what we got in the end of this journey now we're using non-blocking services, but still we got our sanity and we write it in our sequential way. Uh, we got our try-catch expressions. We use for loops and what we used to do, uh, we don't need to learn new paradigm. We got better performance because of non-blocking way in Nate and KTOR. And now we can handle millions of connections because we're not bound to thread pool anymore. And for each connection, we create a new coroutine. Uh, we reduced usage of threads because we don't use them directly anymore. And now we got just dozens of threads instead of hundreds. And because we dropped Spring and reduced uh, thread usage, we also reduced memory usage and four times, even five times sometime. So now we don't need to uh, spend time on overhead of switching threads. We don't spend a lot of memory. And this is how we can place more services on one physical machine, and that, that reduces the uh, cost of running these services in production. So. Uh, to have benefits from coroutines, you don't need to replace your Spring with KTOR. You don't need to replace everything with non-blocking libraries. You can use coroutines to handle your concurrency. Uh, but for us, work like this, and we got these improvements, and that's all. Uh, we still got some time, so if you got any questions, just hit. Yes? You mean common pool in. Yep. You mean common pool for fork join, right? Yes. Yeah. And what so, for instance, when you apply all these frameworks that they all use coroutines, isn't this the same problem? Uh, no, because we use non-blocking way, and I still don't understand what's the problem of your For question. instance, you have a specific number of threads. Yeah, a specific number of threads. Yes, and you specify it somehow. And you apply a lot of frameworks that also use coroutines, and they work in the same thread pool. Yeah. And it might be that you have more requests, actually, than the threads itself. Uh, actually, threads bound to your CPUs, it goes same in GoLang because 
uh, they use max procs like this, but you don't have uh, direct API usage of Golang threads. You only have coroutines API. So with coroutines, you use only coroutines. You don't need to work with those thread pools. You can have them. Uh, and actually, we had before cached thread pool to schedule our blocking code uh, to this pool, but then they introduced IO dispatcher and it simplified everything. Wait, let me ask you differently. Uh, do you specify a number of threads in your thread pool? No, it, it takes uh, two times that you have cores. So if you have six cores, mm -hmm. it will create 12 threads because uh, in your uh, one core can have two hyper threads. So this is why. Yes. yes. Can you pass microphone, please? How does that work if you have uh, different Kotlin applications run running on your system? Because they both see six cores, and they will both allocate 12 threads each? Mm, like two Kotlin applications? Yes. And if they only look at the cores, and they both assign um, a thread yeah, pool of yeah, 12. They, they will use uh, the same uh, CPU cores, but this is how you need to uh, handle it in, in, in your infrastructure. So uh, an example, in Kubernetes, you define uh, how much you want to use your CPU. You can limit this usage or uh, reserve some uh, CPU cores. So uh, you can just reserve all of your CPU only for one service, and it will not share this course with another applications. So it goes on your infrastructure. Yes. And, and what about uh, debug and stack traces? Is it understandable? Yeah, sure. I can show you, actually. We've got some time. Mm, so we don't need here anymore. Let's get some profile like Rick. And if you put here our breakpoint. Now we have user and we can just walk. We got profile, not not profile. Uh, it's idea still has some bugs. Uh, annoying bugs, but it works and you can debug in the same way as you do. And same goes for exceptions. For example, if I throw here an exception. We can see where it goes. Uh, yeah, inside it's completable future because uh, here we can see it's just supplier async and even it's it's blocking because it used thread sleep. It's just for sake of example I use it, but. You will have uh, just callbacks and will truly non-blockable. Yeah, another questions. Uh, sorry, back to thread pools. So, uh, can I have like coroutines that are like I have a higher priority once I'm starting to exhaust my thread pool, that I can make sure like one coroutine gets treated with higher priority than the other ones. Uh, you kind of do this defining your own dispatcher because you can create another dispatcher, not like uh, your default dispatcher, and it will get h higher priority than the others. And when you run your coroutines, you just uh, put them in that dispatcher. So it can be solved like this. Uh, if I understand correctly, you primarily use it with Kotlin. Uh, what about Java interpretability? Do we need some workarounds, right? like uh, oh, annotations, or it is flawless? With Java, if you have a Kotlin code using uh, coroutines and you want to use this code in Java, you have to uh, 
convert them back to completable future so Java can understand that or use callbacks because Java, Java doesn't know how to deal with suspended functions. So you have to do this by yourself, sadly. Yes. Um, I have a question on Ktor framework uh, you've shown. So do you use it already in production? So uh, I, I, last time I saw it was in beta, so I'm just it, wondering. It's officially released and okay. stable now, yes. Uh, do, you, do you have any issues with it so you can mention? Or oh, I had issues when it was in development, but we contributed to Ktor. It was uh, related to Ktor HTTP client. Uh, because I wanted to have some additional wo logic in pipelines and intercepted calls uh, to log results before we return something to user. And it was solved. You can simply contribute or just ask in Slack uh, because uh, developers of this framework are always online and they, will, they are friendly so they will respond to you. And, can help actually solve your issue. Thank you. Yeah. Still got time, so any questions? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for your speech and um, kind of more real question. So in production, in real projects, we have uh, packages, we have services oriented, la layers like yeah. abstractions and things like this. And speaking about, um, Context, so you are running coroutines with the same scope and how it would work with, you know, three or five levels of abstractions? Because of your structured concurrency, uh, you have one parent, uh, parent coroutine like request and all the other coroutines will be created in this scope and if you create more coroutines inside of your children coroutines, they will uh, inherit your parent's scope, so it will be like chain. And this is how you uh, use your thread local and you put this MDC context on start and you will not see it uh, anymore. And for example, in Golang, uh, they got issue with this, so they need to put this context on every argument of your function and pass uh, explicitly this context. But with coroutines in Kotlin, this uh, what compiler do, it implicitly puts in your argument, so you don't need to worry about them. Uh, yes. Okay, I have one question. Uh, at the beginning, uh, you shown us the global scope for the coroutines and the local ones, I believe. And yeah. my question is, uh, when we should use the global and when we should use the local? Because I didn't see uh, the point. Um, the difference that if in your local scope you got an exception, uh, it will help to cancel another coroutines uh, or it will help you to pass context inside uh, your children. Uh, but if you don't have any relations with another coroutines, you can just run in global scope or you even create your own scope like, I don't know, I'll show you. For example, we want to create a scope for our cache. No, job. And we can run this against our scope. And it will use this scope. For Android, uh, you can create your own scopes like activity or whatever you do. Uh, and why you should create another scope, like another global scope, you can have uh, different exception handling uh, because here we don't handle any of exceptions and if there will be an exception, it will go to global scope. And now it goes to uh, my scope, and I can uh, provide here another uh, common uh, exception handler. S and 
For example, if you have uh, like pool of coroutines, you want to run them in a different scope, and if uh, some of your coroutines die, you probably want to create another coroutine. It's uh, for uh, limited concurrency. So this is, did I answer to your question? <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, still four minutes. Yeah. Thank you. And continue previous question. Yeah. So when we launch new coroutine in another scope, yeah. we uh, don't cancel it in case of succession of mm, our original scope. Nope. But we are losing the context. So what if we still need thread local be shared? Ah, but yeah, don't sure. care you, about you, things you, about. You can you can put it. So we can just. That's that's what. What we do? <laughs> we just uh, take like this coroutine context and we put it on a new coroutine so it will still uh, take uh, context from our parent coroutine but it will uh, use different uh, scope for exceptions and cancellations so it will not get cancelled. Gotcha, thanks. Mm, other questions? Probably a weird one. <laughs> so that's all, I guess. Thank you for coming. Hope it was.